Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to week three of Course Judging from Home. My name is Jenny Ivey. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, and I'm excited to see all of you here with us again this week. I'm excited to also introduce Jeffrey Hester, um, our panelist this morning, who will be presenting on how to judge gated horses. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jeffrey is a Austin P. graduate and is currently pursuing his master's at the University of Tennessee. And he also serves as an extension agent in Sumner County here in Tennessee as well. Also helping us answer um, your questions today are Sarah Keenan and Danny Bradford, um, also both extension um, agents within the University of Tennessee and TSU systems. So we're really excited to have them here today. But a couple of quick things that I just wanted to make note of, and I'm going to share a different screen with you here. Um, is that if you all are looking for the recordings from the previous week um, or <clears throat> the first week, you can access them um, at the link that I shared within the chat feature. Um, it should bring you to this page, which is our UT Horse Playlist. And so, as you can see, we have two different um, recordings from the first two weeks, and then also four videos titled um, Gated Weanling, Yearling, Aged, and Under Saddle, respectively. And so Jeffrey will be presenting on these today. And I'd encourage you to watch them um, within the session, but if for some reason your video is um, of poor quality, you can also access them here, and hopefully it will be a little bit easier for you to see and watch the movement of these horses. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey and let him share his screen with you. Dr. Abby, thank you so much for having me today, uh, and Danny and, and Sarah, thank you for helping field questions as I'm sure we will have a very interesting uh, topic with our gated horses division today. So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone back to the UT uh, Horse Judging from Home. Um, like Dr. Abby said, my name is Jeffrey Hester, currently uh, working as a, an adult ag extension, 4-H extension agent in Sumner County, which is in Middle Tennessee. Um, I have been around horses my entire life. Uh, my dad says sometimes I feel like I was born in the barn, um, but especially around uh, gated horses um, within the, the walking horse uh, field. So I wanted to just, looking at the, the slide today, I, I kind of giggled because the, the, the picture behind it, it's kind of a plethora of different colors. And when Dr. Ivy asked me uh, earlier to present on gated horses, depending on who you talk to, is um, a rather open field. Um, and so, you know, with me coming from the walking uh, horse background, um, gated horses actually means American saddlebreds, you know, so that's completely offset of what you would actually think we were looking at today. And so today we're actually going to go from the realm of the gated in the, the walking spotted saddle horse realm um, to look at what are we looking for, you know, in a good gated horse? What makes um, a gated horse a gated horse? And so I just wanted to start with kind of that idea and going into our, our talk. Um, I want to kind of kind of lay out some objectives. Um, I'm all about goal setting and I want to make sure that we get through our talk today and be effective with the time that we have. And so we're going to talk a lot about the term um, form to function a lot today. And so as we go through that, I'll actually define what I mean by form to function. From there, we're going to illustrate this through a couple of videos. Uh, for those that have been part of the um, judging series so far. We have had a practice class at the end of the event. Uh, I will let you know we're not going to have a practice class at the end of this one. And the, the realistic of that is, is because there's such different talent within the gated, it's hard to find four horses to compare to one another. So what I have done in return, uh, like Jenny showed, or Dr. Ivy showed earlier, um, there are those videos that are posted on our YouTube link, just in case your video buffering is a little slower uh, than mine today. Um, feel free to go watch those, um, and you can come back and listen to the recording as we talk through each of those. I also want to tell this, that 
We will keep questions pertaining, uh, make sure that you keep your questions pertaining to the gated horses or the form to function. Um, the, those that are answering questions today will delete any questions that are out of that topic area. So please, I ask when you are answering those questions that you do keep your questions to our pertaining subject. And as long as we stay on those, objecti on those objectives, we're gonna have a good class. So a uh, couple of terms that you might hear me throw out, and, and I'm just learning from, uh, again, being an extension agent, sometimes we uh, that have been in the, the industry for a long time, we use terms and words that we know and understand, but maybe our, uh, the, the general public or those that we're talking to may not. And so some of the things that you might hear me say, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna talk form to function today. And I hope that if there's one thing by the end of this class that you understand, it's gonna be form to function. And form to function is where structure meets movement. And so we'll talk about that here next. You'll hear me talk about rear stride, drive and impulsion a lot. And that's having to do with the movement of the rear legs of our gated horses. Um, our horses, uh, gated horses and specifically spotted saddle horse and walking horses, they do move completely different than horses that we've learned about so far. Um, you'll hear me talk about animation. And that's just talking about movement from the front end of the horse. Um, I would probably say in hand, uh, rather than halter, because coming from our back, uh, from this background, we do have, um, we, we call halter classes in hand. So if you hear me talk about in hand, I'm just talking about confirmation. And you might hear me refer to the term of parked out in that in hand class. Once our horses are done exhibiting uh, on the right hand, you know, right hand and left hand on the rail when they're finished, um, they will then line up like a class and they will typically present themselves in a parked out position and and we'll look at that um, and that's just a confirmation setup so just real that's just something i know you'll hear me refer to some of these terms and so just that way you kind of had those in the back of your head um, i just wanted to make sure that you uh you, you could hear you understood what we were talking about before we go further All right, and so we're gonna look at form to function and I was talking with one of our question panelists earlier today and we, you look at uh, one of the, the stallions out on parole, which, you know, and I guess I can look at a lot of walking horse stallions and tell you that there's always something that we can pick from. And as we progress in our industry, um, I know you heard the speaker uh, last week referred to you know, a, a squared hindquarters and, and we'll talk about that, you know, here in a little bit, but you know, sometimes the, the walking horse, the, the spotted saddle horse, the walking horse side doesn't necessarily fit completely uh, to what we talked about last week in confirmation. So a lot of our talk today is going to be on form. And form is the confirmation. What makes that horse up? What structural uh, thing that make that horse what it is? And so we take that form, that structural correctness, and that's what creates its function. And for those that, that know walking horses, that know spotted saddle horses, it's the function of that smooth gait. It's the, what gets that horse from one point to the next, um, the rider to be able to ride and have a comfortable ride while they're going. So form is structure confirmation. Um, you know, it's, it's what makes the horse, uh, what makes this breed the breed. So like we mentioned last week, I think that even when it comes to the, the gated division, balance is the key. You have to understand that when you look at the judging criteria, there are so many things that you can uh, talk about. There are so many things that you can pick at and, and pull and, and say this and that, but I want you to realize that balance is one of one of the most important things to look at when it comes to any type of uh, horses when you're judging these horses um, and balance is the ability to divide that horse into three equal portions um, and it, I'm going to see if I can pull up my annotator thing uh, one second please all right well um, Jenny do you, can they see my mouse as I want as I move over I know earlier I was able to have a, a little laser beam thing uh, yes, I can see your mouse as you hover okay, over it. 
Perfect. So when we divide that horse, we have that front third, uh, middle third, and rear third, just like we learned last week in our confirmation classes. Um, and we want to see the same thing with our walking horses as well, with that, those gated horses as well, to divide themselves up into those uh, three uh, equal one-third portions. Um, I was sharing earlier with, with a, a coworker that as we progress in industry, and, and I think we see a lot of changes within all types of horse industries, we do see the front third of walking horses to get a little longer, um, sometimes even a little larger than the other two. And it's just because, you know, that they, they have the, those shoulder where, where they're, dry, they're, they're pulling from their shoulder and moving those front feet. Um, so, but we do want to stick as best we can to that balancing of being able to, again, those three equal parts. If we were to divide that horse, that they are equal in that front shoulder region, the barrel region, and the rear hind quarters. I think we move on into this form, and although you might be saying, well, how in the world would a head and neck affect the form or the function of that horse? And it's not necessarily the head and neck change the movement of the horse, but there are some things that I really want you to note when we look at what does a, what is a, a walking, what is a, a, a gated breed supposed to look like? And once again, when we, in our discussion today, when we talk about gated, we are referring to the spotted saddle horses and our walking horses. So looking at the head and neck, so we want that refined head. And the picture, the horse that we have here is not necessarily the best picture to be using. Um, I do, I just like to use one horse to have a consistency throughout the discussion. Um, so we will be using this image of the horse for a little bit of this discussion today. Um, and we will look at some things that, that we might change, some things that are, that are prominent about the horse. But just so you knew uh, at the forefront, this may not be the ideal one to be looking at here. So with that refined head, refined meaning lacking impurities, right? So with the refined head, we want that head to be proportional to the body. Now listen, there isn't a mathematical algorithm or some kind of formula that's like, okay, how big the body is, so here's the, the, the size that the head should be. I'm not saying that there's a specific uh, formula to use. It is when you take back and look at the balance of that horse, does the size of its head, is it proportion to the rest of its body? When you look along this throat latch area where you see this, this kind of short arrow here, um, you really want it to be clean. Um, I'm gonna scan to the next slide real quick and, and I've kind of cleaned it up a little bit for you. You see how we've, um, we've changed that throat latch. So here we have that kind of that saggy skin of flap. This is kind of just throwing in a, a, a triangle there. We wanna kind of keep that throat latch area clean. Now, can we do that by, you know, uh, you know, probably through a nutritional process, but it's really, it's genetic. And, and again, it's one of those things that we breed for with that defined uh, throat latch area. And that's just, to, again, to be able to have that clean like attachment from head to neck. Um, when we look at the, the facial bones, so our cheekbones here on the side and even our, our, our jaw here, we want those to be a very chiseled like. Um, almost as if they were carved very specifically. Um, we want them to be very prominent on the horse's face. When I look at the eyes, here, um, the eyes that, of the horse that we see here, to me, are, are a little larger than what it should be on this horse's head. However, I still want eyes that are bold, that are bright. Now, I get it. It's, you know, the, the color of this horse's eye, how do you make black? A bright color. I'm not asking for coloration of the eye. I'm asking for that eye to be open, for it to be alert, for it to be attentive. When we look at the forehead, this, this front of the horse's head here, I want it to be a very straight, very, a, a very straight line there. Um, you know, with, there are breeds such as the Arabian that have the concave or the dish faced. Um, that's not something that we want to see in our walking horses. If you look at the old war horses where they have the Roman noses or the convex faces, that is also something that is not, uh, it is un it's undesirable to see uh, in our walking horses. The ears of the horse, we want them to be well set right at the pole. And, you know, if, if you're still learning parts of, um, 
the if you're still learning the parts of the horse again that pole is the northern the topmost part of the horse we want those um ears to be to be set right at the pole to be nice and alert facing forward so we want those ears to be carried forward like you see here what does that show us as a judge what does that show us as a, a horse owner or even as the rider that horse is attentive to what's going on and alert to what's going on in front of them we also want to make sure that as we move down the face to the muzzle area that we have a well blended muzzle as well as those nostrils are large now you're like why in the world would uh, large nostrils be something that is uh, ideal or desirable it just shows us that that it's that that horse, that animal is able to move air. Again, what is the function of this animal? To be able to move. And like I said, in order to move, they have to move oxygen. So that's something that we do look for within the head. As we move into the next, sorry, Dr. Ivy, what is it? No, you're fine. Before you move um, off the head, would you mind to go into a little more detail about what a chiseled head means and what you would look for specifically um, if using that particular adjective. I think when I think of chiseled and uh, you know if, if one of my other counterparts may know something, if I look at chiseled, let's compare it as someone in you know that sculpts stone with a hammer and a chisel. Everyone, a, a chisel is a, a tool that helps to um, create details, all right? Um, to create, and I'm all about illustration, so y'all picture this with me. Let's say I have a hammer and chisel versus, and I've got a stone that I'm carving, versus I have a hedge out beside my house that I've got a pair of hedge trimmers that's electric. You know, if I go to town with this electric hedge trimmer, it's probably not going to turn out as pretty as if I were to have that stone and a small chisel and hammer. So when I say chisels, to answer the question, is well defined i'm able to see it and if i know the coloration of our horse here um, doesn't necessarily portray um, everything i want to see but if you look right around the cheeks of this horse that side bone that we see here you can see that cheekbone being portrayed you can see the jaw that jaw line that we see on the bottom of its muzzle of its um, the mandible here uh, the jaw line as it's chiseled you can see that bone structure um, it would be like um, in humans, you know, those that have a very chiseled, you know, a very, a very uh, tight jawline versus those that may not. Uh, I hope that that helps with the chiseling there. That's All great. Right, to, is, did that help, Dr. Ivy? Yes, that's perfect. Thanks, Jeffrey. As we move on to the neck, same thing with the head. We want the neck to be proportioned to the rest of his body. If you remember, there isn't an algorithm. I can't plug and chug a number as to what the length of the body is to give me what the size of the neck should be. You will, as, as the judge, if you, again, taking a step back and looking at the balance, the horse overall, you can tell if a horse has a longer body, the horse needs a longer head. If the horse has a shorter body, the horse needs a shorter head and so forth. So that neck just needs to be proportionate to the rest of its body. After all, this neck plays the balance arm to movement. When we get into that form, uh, the, the function here a little bit, the movement of the horse, you'll see walking horses are really strategic in how they utilize their head to balance the rest of their body. I wanna make sure that the neck, as it comes out of its shoulders, as it comes out of the withers there, it is, it's carried high. It's kind of that pompous uh, attitude, so to speak. It's very um, alert, very attentive. It shows me as the rider or me as the judge that this horse is carrying itself in a very um, high mannerism. I also want to make sure that that neck is graceful. What do I mean by a graceful neck? And as I look here, it's in, the, in our gated world, or, and again, when I talk gated, I'm, I'm specifically in our discussion today, we're talking spotted saddle horses and the walking horse breeds. Um, I'm looking at, it is undesirable to have an, an excessive arching neck, such as our friends in the Arabian world. Again, Arabians, it's cool. That's one of their breed characteristics. For walking horses, it is not. Um, if it is slightly arched, again, that's that grace that we're, that the graceful portion we're looking for. I just want, I don't want it to be so excessive. 
Also, as we see, I'm gonna call my, my, my horse right here. If we look at the very top of this neck, this crest area that, that we talk here, that's actually a little bit more crest than what I would want to see in a walking horse. So realize that an excessive arch or an excessive crest, which again is what I'm drawing here with this line at the top, that is undesirable to see uh, in the walk in, in our gated world. We're going to move on to the front end of our horse here. And, and as again, I'm trying to keep for the sake of consistency, the picture on the far right, I'm going to try to keep it the same horse throughout um, so we can kind of keep a, a, again, a consistent look uh, for it. So I know uh, our speaker last week shared about the angle of the shoulder, right? Well, to me, when I'm looking on the outside of the horse, it's like, okay, I see the shoulder, but what are they talking about? And so if you look at the x-ray image here um, in the pink box, that's that angle of shoulder that we were talking about. As it rolls from, as it comes from those withers down to the chest and down to the arm, you know, that shoulder has that 45 degree angle. Again, I don't have a compass. I don't have a protractor. I can't measure the angle as I'm standing back you just begin to have an eye for what that 45 degree angle shoulder looks like. Um, what are some other defects, some other things that I look for on the front end as I'm looking at our in-hand classes? Um, if I look toward the blue picture, again, this was probably shared at last week's, but just reiterating at, uh, what we're looking for in, in, this, in this type. And I'm sorry, these, these images, I have mirrored them, so that's why the letters are backwards. Um, I'm all about consistency, so I'm trying to stay the same here. If I look at this far, in the blue box, on the right, we have letter A, this image A. That is the ideal, right? So as if you see that vertical line coming down from the top of that shoulder down to the coffin bone, the, the leg is very vertical with that, or very parallel with that line, right? So if I look over at B, look how the knee has now moved in front of that vertical, in front of that line. We learned last week, we call that buck knee, right? It's in front. This is not desirable to see in, uh, our, in our, our gated horses. As well as C here, that knee is now in behind that vertical line, meaning with, this is, we learned last week, this is calf knee. Neither of these are, um, we, do we want to see these in an ideal situation, right? Now, there's always something to, you know, maybe not, it, it, I, you know, without seeing a perfect horse, right? You know, you're always going to find some degree of uh, structural defect, right? So if I'm looking at these, you know, all, both buck knee and, and calf knee, whether it's, you know, again, in front of the vertical or behind the vertical, both of these, again, are undesirable to see because in time, they can lead to unsoundness, right? The horse may not have any issues with um, structural soundness today, but in time, it could possibly, um, you know, change the, the, the movement of that horse. Moving into the green box there, um, not when the, so I don't want you to get camped out and camped under, or camped under and camped out mixed up with parked out, right? So, this is when a horse is standing. If you look at our, again, our, our, our similar image on the right with our, our gray horse here, um, you can actually see that our horse is actually camped under a little bit, right? And it may be the fact of how the handler has them, has them stood. However, you know, being both camped out, again, with that leg being in front of the vertical or camped in with the leg being behind that vertical, both of these can prevent this horse from having the fluid movement that it's supposed to. And again, as we're learning about these forms, uh, the structure that we're looking for, all of these structures lead to its function. And if the form isn't there, the function isn't there. Meaning, if the structure's not ex an ideal or what we're looking for, its, it's movement may not be what we're looking for. Moving on up into the, into the top line, looking again from this profile view here. So simply with the top line, just like you and I, all right? I mean, I, I'm sure the doctor would like me to work out a little bit more, but we keep our core, you know, as we're, as we're sitting in a chair, as we're walking, as we're lying down, our core and our, our lumbar, our lower back helps to stabilize us, right? 
That's the same way within horses. They utilize their top line to help stabilize them in movement. And so if we look at the top line of our, of our horse here, we really want the top line from that, those withers to croup to be very level. Now here we see that the withers on our horse here is a little bit higher than our croup. That is as long as it's not excessive, right? I can forgive a little bit. We just don't want it to be excessive in the fact where those withers are extremely higher than the croup. Because again, the ideal is I'm looking for it to be level. We also want that back, as we look at the back, and in, in proportion to the rest of its body. I know I've said that probably five times now, but you have to, again, it goes back to what is the key to judging any type of force? It was balance, right? If you said balance, you were correct. Balance is the key. And so if I take a look back, okay, I have this size of horse, I really want to have a shorter back because typically with shorter backs, we have a stronger top line. Um, and that, that horse is able to carry themselves uh, better, maybe even to carry the rider in a better manner. So we wanna make sure that we have that shorter back rather than having a long back. The difference that we see here that we're about to move on as we talk about the hindquarters, notice from our horse here versus the stock horses that we were looking at last week, what happens as I get to that croup and roll down to my tail head? Is it level? It isn't. We actually drop off. Now, within our, within our breed, this is okay, as long as it's not excessive. And we're about to look at what that is. Let's move on down into our hindquarters. I'm gonna talk um, from left to right. So we're gonna start with our picture on the left in the green box, and we'll move into the rear view with the pink box on the right. So when I'm, and before, and before I get to the, the legs, excuse me, back up into the hind quarter. Um, does anyone know, and I know I can't hear you on this side, but you can comment or chat over here. Who remembers when we were viewing that, that rear, the hind quarter, what was the shape we were looking for? Was it a circle? No. Was it a triangle? No. Was it a trapezoid? It wasn't. It was a square. So it's a little different with our, our gated horses. We, we do want to look for the square. However, if you, we were, I was talking earlier with a coworker. If, if you find a horse, a, a gated horse that has a really nice square hindquarter, you found something. All right. Most of our gated horses have that more of a triangular look. So if I go from that point of hip, which is right below the croup, down to the point of the butt, right where the tail head is, down to the stifle, it's more of that triangular look and not the, the box, that square. It's more, we're more forgiving in our industry. We can forgive and, and, and still take that triangular. What we don't want to have is excessive slope in, that, uh, in behind the croup. So if I look down at this in this green box, before I look down at the hock area, Let's look at this hind quarter of uh, letter B. And again, it's flipped, so the B is backwards. Um, as it comes back down from the croup, look how excessive of a slope that we have there. That is something that I would, that I would look at and mark you know, with that excessive slope of the croup. But when, as we move on down into our legs, so if I look at A, which again is our, our horse in the green box on the right, then B and then C, so A, if I'm looking in the, in the circle where our hock is, that is that the ideal hock, right, from the profile. It's the ideal angulation of the hock. B, that someone tell me from last week, we learned in confirmation, if an angle of the hock is too much, if there's too much angulation, we call that what? Anyone know? We call it sickle hocked, sickle hocked. So if we move on into C, where there's not any uh, angulation in the hock at all, we call it post leg. Now, you see the stars above A and B. Well, in the gated world, yes, A is ideal. However, if you see some angulation of the hock, so if it's slightly sickle hocked, in our world, that is not a structural defect, right? Unless it's excessive and why is why is sickle hawk something bad why is is this something that when you know when we're what does it do to the function of the horse well 
Again, the sickle hop, being sickle hop, can cause leg deformities and, and structural issues later on in time, right? Well, with the, within our walking industry, what is something, you know, when we think of, of gated horses and we think of, of the walking horses uh, and spotted saddle horse, we talk a lot about that rear drive, right? We talk about when that horse's leg moves up underneath them and they're reaching up underneath them. Being slightly sickle hopped, being having uh, some, uh, a little bit more angulation in the hop than normal, right? Allows that horse to reach even further up underneath him, right? It allows him to reach further and drive. It allows that movement to be more fluid. It allows that, that horse to uh, cover more ground. So in our industry, sickle hop is not necessarily a bad thing unless it's excessive, all right? Excessive meaning, and, and how, again, there's not a degree. I can't say, well, it's, it's this degree is too much. If I were to watch this horse move, right? And I'm seeing issues as it's not a consistent movement. I'll, you know, maybe every third stride, a rear leg is, uh, we talk, you know, it, it hinges, the, the stifle hin or the hock uh, hinges are in movement. That's when things are excessive. When, a, if a horse is slightly sickle hocked in those rear legs and it can still move very fluid, then it's still acceptable and ideal in our industry. As you look to the picture on the right, the pink picture, which is the, re the hawk view from the rear side. Last week we learned, again, A was ideal. B, when the hawks are very close together, we call that the, we call it what? Cow hawked. If those hawks are very far apart and it's, a lot, and it's causing the toes to point inward, right? What do we call that? What kind of hawk was that? It's actually bow legged, right? So within our, our gated division, again, A is certainly ideal. However, if those hocks are, we're more, a little bit more forgiving with the, the narrowness of the rear end. Now, if you were to look at a stock course and a stock course had um, their hocks were that close together, it is definitely something to, um, to, de uh, to count off for, right? But with our walk, with our, our gated horses, with the spotted saddle horse and walking horses, we do forgive a little bit with those hocks being closer together. Again, because with a little bit more angulation in the hock and a little bit more angle with those legs, these horses are able to move their rear legs in a far greater degree. So we've looked a lot on, uh, on form. And again, that, that term that we used earlier was form to function. Form was the structure. Function is the movement, is the ability for that horse to move. And again, it's the function of the horse is why I fell in love with the Tennessee walking horse years ago. And it's because, uh, we'll look in a second, I, I can, you know, uh, I can take my walking mare. We don't show. We literally go trail riding. I can ride my, my mare for 20 miles or whatever, you know, for a long distance and still be, um, feel like I'm, I'm, I'm recreational riding. We can cover some ground. We can and still have that smoothness of gait and that fluidity of the gait. And it's about the function. It's the movement. So how do these horses get that movement? So I want to talk real quick about these three pictures here. And you're like, wait a minute. Uh, two of these horses are not gated. Well, I, I understand. But for the sake of our argument here, I want you to look at the horse on the left, right? This hunter under saddle horse we have is moving at a trot. Well, a trot is a diagonal movement, right? Meaning the front right and the back left and the front left and the back right move simultaneously. The middle picture, the standard bread, this is a lateral movement, right? Meaning both left legs are moving at one point and both right legs are moving at one point. I want you to look at these two pictures, the hunter under saddle and the standard bread behind cart. So if you look at these horses, are any of their feet touching the ground? It might look like the, 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 rear, uh, the rear right leg of the hunter under saddle horse is, is on the ground, but actually both horses here, our diagonal movement and then our standard bread in the center, our lateral movement, none of their legs are touching the ground. This is why their gates are a little bit more rough than that of a gated horse. Let's look at the gated horse on the right. 
Notice I tried to uh, mark with circles below kind of where those legs are placed, right? It's front left, rear right, and rear left are on the ground. The only leg that is off the ground is its front right. With, with this, walking horses at, or, and gated horses in our discussion today, at any point when they are in a correct gait, again, can, can gated horses trot? They certainly can. Can gated horses pace? They certainly can. Um, side you note, know, a little side note here. Um, so with our walking horses, we actually do, and I'm not sure if anyone's familiar, we actually do speed racking. And so I, 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 you know, our breed is more of the racking side and, and we breed our horses for speed. However, you know, as we, you know, they have their natural gait, but as we train them to, to move faster uh, and, and to, you know, find greater speeds, they can set up into a pace or they can set up into a trot. And so, yes, gated horses can do both diagonal and lateral movement, but what we want them to do in a correct gait, all right, a true gated horse will have three, horse, three feet on the ground, which helps to keep that fluid movement, right? It's what we look for in that fluid movement, the smooth ride as we move um, across the ground. So that's where that movement begins. And we're gonna break that down here with our next slide. So as we look at a still shot of our, of our horse here that's in movement, um, I've kind of just placed some pink bars here just to kind of uh, grab our attention. I want to start in that rear drive. Again, these horses move rather different than other horses that we might have seen thus far. So on those rear legs, those legs drive, again, drive an impulsion, drive up underneath them to carry them. It's what pushes them. It what gives them, it's what gives the horse momentum, right? Those front legs, there's not as much reach from the front legs as it was in the back. However, notice that graceful arch as this horse is pulling up out of his shoulders to place his feet onto the ground. Now, what are the lines about the neck? Well, it's to show that that neck moves up and down, depending on what, Jeffrey? It depends on the length of the rear stride. If that horse is reaching under further, it's going to use its it's, it's neck to counterbalance, counteract, to keep it balanced and keep the horse standing upright. What are the images on the right? Well, they're just some talking points for me, all right? It's not just a rocking chair. It's not just a glass of water. It's not just a key. The rocking chair. I'm sure several of you have heard of um, maybe one of the gates as the rocking chair canter. Um, if you look at, you know, walking horses or even, you know, spotted saddle horses, they've got their walk flat walk, walk, whatever you want to call it. They've got the running walk, which is their, their second gait. It's that it is a, a walk, but more um, animation in the front, more rear drive, a little bit more speed, more head shake with it. Some, uh, and, and, and some walking horses and spot of saddle horses are even trained to have that canter to them. Now, canter is a natural gait for any horse, right? But as they move, it allows that rider, it feels like you're in that kind of that rocking chair back and forth. It, it pulls you um, forward and backward as you move. But it's all, you know, all of their gaits. If, if they're in a true walk, if they're in a true uh, running walk or a true gait, uh, as, we, as we say, you're going to kind of have that, that forward backward momentum as you would in the rocking chair. What is that glass of water? Well, it's kind of what made me fall in love with the, um, the walking horse or the gated horse in general. You know, back to, again, my favorite thing to do with horses is to go out and ride trail, go trail riding, is to recreational riding. And so you're able to kind of have your, you know, I'm, you can go in a, and, and carry an oak, you know, a glass with water in it. And as you're riding, because the gates are smooth, that water is not going to spill. And I'm not saying we literally carry water in our hands. I'm talking that just is a reference to, to show you how smooth these gates are supposed to be. If I'm looking at a, a gated class, right, and I've got some horses in there, and I've got a rider that looks like she's about, or he or she's about to bounce off this horse, it's probably not in a gate as it's supposed to be, right? Gated horses, again, are gonna have that forward, backward uh, movement in the saddle. They're gonna have that smooth and fluid, uh, that fluid movement um, with the rider. The bottom, it's a key. What's a key mean? 
it's not just the movement all right the key is the can it it's not just the movement right i can have a really good horse come in the the class first off right and that horse can have four five ten twelve really good strides and all of a sudden can have you know something the back leg doesn't move as far you know the key to looking at these these gated horses is i want consistency consistency is the key i want a horse that looks like they're moving in the back the same way from from gate in or from the time they come into the gate to the time they leave uh the gate i want a horse that uh, my you know the, the mare that i have you know she's we ride you know from from the first hour of trail riding it's the same type of consistent gait as we are at the end of trail riding okay consistency is the key when looking into the movement of these horses now i believe next we're going to move into and and these next are some videos and and so i want to repeat what we talked earlier uh, at the beginning of our presentation so i know sometimes your internet wherever you're at may not be as uh, uh fast as some others so these videos may be very choppy all right i want you to go and look at the link that dr ivy provided earlier um and it's in the chat box um i you know i challenge you go look at those if your internet's choppy over the next couple of seconds go look in the chat box, find the link, go watch the videos, and then come back and compare them to what we talked about. But again, we're not gonna have necessarily a judging practice class. I want you to look um, and see some of the things that I'm gonna be pointing out. The cool thing, and I guess the difference that, as we, to introduce into these videos, Horses, uh, gated horses for, for me, right? Where other industries might have, you know, uh, the, some stock horses might be a good halter horse, but they may not be a good horse under saddle, right? In our gated world, again, we're talking walking horses, spotted saddle horses. These horses that are in hand, again, halter, these in hand horses should be really good under saddle horses because form should fit function and that's what we're going to show here in us uh, with these videos so once again if the videos are choppy there's no sense commenting in the comments my video is not working just after we're completed go to the link that we provided earlier watch those videos and then you can cor uh, compare them to what our discussion is that we're having here. so this first one is a wingling us uh, this is not a, a paint that some may call this is a spotted saddle horse here that is on the rail and it's a weanling right so <clears throat> this weanling again has that that rear drive and impulsion look even as uh, as young as the weanling is how much it's driving um from the rear side but i want to back this video up from the beginning and talk again here um watch the one thing that i want to point out about every three strides the left rear leg reaches up further. There's a little hitch um, in that leg, a little bit of a stop in that leg. That's where I go back to the consistency. Sometimes as these, these horses age, that consistency gets better, that problem gets fixed. Notice, again, that rear, those rear legs is activating that horse's head, even, even with that handler um, holding right there with the halter and lead, that head is moving up and down to counterbalance those rear those rear legs there we're going to look at this same horse but this time as a yearling okay this is the same spotted saddle horse but this time as a yearling notice how much as again this horse has grown but now this horse look at reaching just as this horse is being lunged how much this horse wants to reach up underneath uh, up underneath him um, even with what you know his his front feet as they're moving and that grace arch that they create I want to play it again for us as we walk, um, as we lunge around here. And once again, I want to reiterate, there is a link in our chat box. I would challenge you, if, if your videos are very choppy, go watch them on YouTube and then come back and look at um, some of our comparisons that we have. Notice that horse still is having, the, again, about every four or five uh, strides or every four or five leg movements, that back left leg um and so this horse here again as it ages it might um change um and it might be something that who that the rider might have to adjust with um as they as they ride 
We're going to look at another video. This one is actually an aged walking horse. Hey, Jeffrey. Um, yes, ma'am. Before you jump to the aged horse, we have a question. Is there such a thing as too much rear drive? Well, and, and I, I think I saw earlier in our chat box about walking and racking and, you know, the difference in the two. And if I look at that, that overstride from those rear legs, um, typically you're, though you have walking horses that are either walking or racking, right? Walking horses are actually, when, if they are truly matching their gait, their rear leg should come up and meet their front leg. So if I were to draw like a, a, a movement pattern, um, their rear leg should almost come take the place of uh, their front legs as they move. Um, racking horses are going to um, you know, do the same, but they're not going to be reaching up underneath as much. Um, spotted saddle horses, depending on um, the, the bloodline, um, some reach just as far, some are more of a just a more of that saddle, uh, short, shorter stride movements. But the question was, is there too much of a rear drive? I would think, and this goes back to my consistency is key. I have seen uh, walking horses that they, when you talk about rear leg drive, they reach very far under. However, is the fluid of their, is their movement very fluid? Is their movement look natural? Does the movement look as if it's, um, uh, without effort right so i guess the answer to that was too much rear drive if it, it it's too much if it affects the fluidity of the movement great thank you so much so as we look into our our aged uh, walk, uh walking horse here notice again Pro, you know, uh, talking with the owner may not be the most structurally sound, but look how far, even under lunge, at a, at a flat walk here, what uh, the, the, the rear legs, how much they're moving up underneath them. And if you can imagine someone being on top of, you know, riding this horse in saddle here, you can imagine that movement of those rear legs forcing that rider to move back and forth in that saddle. I'll play it one more time for our viewers here. And again, with the rear drive, and even uh, on the front, you know, having, you know, picking, and I, you know, probably maybe in a, in a pasture where they're having to pick the feet up above the, uh, the grass, but still picking the, their legs up and not even being in any type of uh, bridle or saddle. Um, this horse still has that natural head shake, the natural animation in the front, and the natural rear drive. And so I want to want to wrap up our discussion with. Um, and I'm only going to play one of these videos on, in the video on the right. Um, if you look at, and it, I apologize, it's only the first couple of, uh, about first 10 seconds of the video, a couple of things that I would change with this horse as uh, she comes around the arena, the, the angle of the head, if the rider would let the head go a little bit, that, that head would be a little bit more fluid. But notice how much rear drive this, this mare has, and she gets a little choppy as she comes around. Um, but as we move around to the other side of the arena here, get past this tree. And again, I apologize for the pixel pixelation issue, but look how with the rear, the rear drive and even with the front, the front end animation, um, under saddle. So whether it be in hand as a weanling, whether it be, um, in hand as a yearling, even as in hand as a young, we we follow as the industry, we follow that form fits function. If the horse has the function that it's supposed to, if the horse has um, the, the, the structural correctness, should fit its function. It should be a good gated horse, whether under saddle as an athlete or under saddle um, recreational riding. So I kept it very short, very sweet. I'll be glad to continue to answer questions. Um, that's all I have from this standpoint. If there are other questions uh, staying on, Dr. Alley, I'll be glad to answer from there. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind, would you talk a little bit about when you're evaluating, um, you know, the gait and also just maybe in creating your reasons, um, maybe some terminology that's appropriate to use um, when, when judging gated horses maybe compared to other stock type breeds? 
Okay. So again, I know I've, I've said drive and impulsion um, a lot. And I know we talk about um, uh, drive and impulsion within the, hunt, the hunter under saddle breed. However, drive and impulsion is a very, uh, a term to use. Um, I would also talk when we talk about uh, consistency, it's consistency in, in the fluid of movement, consistency within the gait, whether it be at the flat walk, the running walk, um, a favorite gait or the canter. Um, and I know I didn't show a canter today, but um, you know, you, you want these, you want the gates and, and, and terminal, you want the gates to be very naturalistic. Um, it doesn't look as, it looks effortless for both the horse and the rider. I have seen horse rider combos that go in, that go in a, in a, in a, a class and it's like, uh, it's almost as if they come out sweating and, and just because it was a hard ride, it was like almost having to um, force that horse to uh, do what they're supposed to. So, you know, I talk about driving impulsion from the rear, animation from the front. When I say animation, I'm not talking about um, cartoons. Listen, when we talk about animation from the front, we're talking about that knee, the, the knee action, the, 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 the reach from those front feet. Um, I want to talk about, you know, again, the, the horses, Tennessee walk and walking horses are known for their docility, right? Their attitudes, their temperament. That horse should have a, should be a very uh, calm and controlled um, as they're in and out of that arena. Um, so I would talk a lot about, you know, again, if I were looking at reasons, I'm looking for driving impulsion, animation from the front. I'm looking for consistency within their gates, and I'm looking for mannerisms uh, from the horse and rider. Did that help answer some questions, Dr. Ivy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I know I saw float through the chat earlier um, that Sarah and Danny have been cleaning up throughout the presentation. Um, would you talk a little bit about the way they classify gated horses, either two gate or three gate, um, and what that means with regard to judging? Uh, and maybe Sarah or, or Dr. Ivy help me. Are you when you talk? Are we talking uh, gated horses that flat walk, running walk versus flat walk, running walk canter? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and re ask your question. Um, basically, you just answered about if we said it's a two gate horse, what oh, gates okay. are they doing versus a three gate? Um, okay, so yeah, so in in our in our shows, um, typically the the class you will see either a two gate that sometimes they call them a specialty class. Um, you know, some classes require the canter, some horse, uh, some classes do not. Um, and to me, um, when I look at walking horses and gated horses, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of the big reason why my, my, the mare that I talk about, you know, good trail riding and recreational riding, that's the main reason why she doesn't show as much as she does is because, you know, a lot of our local shows require, you know, there's not really specialty classes, so to speak. They're requiring that third gate, which is that canter. And her canter is not the, the most fluid movement. It's almost as if she's, it, it kind of looks like an ugly rear. Um, and so she does, you know, does her best, but, you know, those two versus three, that three gate adds in the canter. Perfect. And then um, one of the questions I get a lot as a state specialist are where could either leaders or agents go um, for resources specifically on judging gated horses? Because there's a lot out there for stock horses, but not as many for these breeds. Do you have any good recommendations for them? This entire, all of the information that I pulled today, um, and, and I couldn't find the year that it was done, I pulled it off of the, the, the Tweeba, and I'll... Um, I'm gonna see if I can unstop sharing my screen to see if I can go find the link to it and I'll stick it in the chat box. So the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association, um, that is the, where I pulled all of uh, this judging information today. Just to have some, let's see if I can pull up. Uh, and I'll put the, I will stick this link in the chat box. Perfect, and I may have missed it um, when we first started just with getting everything running, but um, would you mind to talk a little bit about why the stance for the Tennessee Walking Horse and some of the others is much more parked out than we would expect from the stock breeds and where that came from? So I will share, uh, I'll go back to that first. Um,
So as you see, as you see here, you know, that's, that was that parked out stance that we talked about earlier. And it's, it's not, you know, not to get confused with the camped out and camped under or camped in and camped out. Um, this is that stance as when they're, when, and when a class of walking horses now spot a saddle horse, depending, may, uh, might be a little different. This is one of those things that when they are completed with the course and they're in lineup, um, the park out is to display from pole down is to display that this, the, 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 the top line. And I know that being under saddle is a little different. However, it does, it, it shows the stride. It shows the, um, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of my word here. Um, the, the capacity of, of reach of that horse, the, the, the body volume of that horse. And, and Sarah, um, if there's something, or you or Danny, if there was something that add to that, that I was missing, throw it in the chat box if you want. Um, but it's one of those, it, it's a breed, you know, we talked about breed characteristics last week, right? Um, it's just one of those breed characteristics with the walking horses that parked out does help. It, it allows the, it's, when I think of, um, you know, allowing a strength to be in that top line. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've cleaned up all the questions that were asked within our Q&A session. So um, we'll give Jeffrey a virtual round of applause and say thanks to him and also to Sarah and Danny for fielding most of the questions during uh, this week's session. Uh, next week. And, and on Sarah, thank you so much for helping answer those questions. Absolutely. And next week is our final session. Uh, week four, we'll be talking about um, showmanship and equitation with Kaylee Vandekamp. Um, so we're looking forward to see you all next week um, using the same link. And again, you can access those videos that Jeffrey showed today, along with the full recordings from each week um, at the links that were in the chat box. Thanks so much.